Hello, everybody. This is the CUDA and Open Lab Seminar, Cultural Data Analytics Open Lab Seminar on uh, November 7, 2022. Um, today, we are very, very happy to have um, Andreas Fickers and the group from the um, uh, Digital History Lab, uh, C2DH, um, from Luxembourg. Um, and the sort of topic of the session today is Inside the Trading Zone, an encounter with the Digital History Lab. Um, and as has been said before this meeting already, um, we're very much we're looking forward to this. Um, typically, we so far have met groups which are in resonance and aligned with what we're doing, but this is really close, I think. So there is a lot of really interesting work that is in the overlap of traditional humanities, cultural research disciplines with um, cultural data analytics, um, um, machine learning, computer science kind of stuff going on. And um, so this is a really, really interesting um, um, moment to learn how other people um, interpret that, perform that, uh, are successful in it, because you are. Um, and uh, I've just learned, so you, you are going on since like five years right now, which uh, I assume you may have also solved the problem of sustaining um, a, a group like that. And um, what we will have is a bunch of presentations. So um, there's a general introduction. There is um, a talk on a virtual exhibition. Um, there is uh, something on Minette story, augmented artwork analysis, the Statec project presentation and uh, presentation of the Journal of Digital History. Um, we have a two hour time slot as we always have in this open lab seminar uh, meetings. Um, the guests um, are very, very uh, welcome to sort of uh, guide us in how these two hours are uh, sort of supposed to be spent. So I assume, um, you know, the minute, if, if it's a lecture, we do 40 minutes talk, uh, 80 minutes discussion. Um, or if somebody likes to talk for two hours, then there's not much discussion. Um, we can do discussion at the end, we can disperse discussion in this particular format where we have six things we can discuss after each one, or we can postpone the discussion towards the end. Like that's um, basically as you want to take it. Um, and um, I think we should start with, I just hand over the word to Andreas Fickers, who will give us a general introduction of the lab. So you're very welcome uh, and thank you very much. If you want, we can do a quick introduction round of ourselves um, at the end uh, or um, at the beginning. So that's up to you, basically. I so think you... it would make sense to do it now. Okay. Uh, so we know that who we are talking to. Who we are talking to, exactly. <laughs> So let's just do a, a quick round. Uh, and so basically, um, my name is Maximilian Schich. Um, I'm my PhD is in art history. I little, did a little bit too much classical archaeology for that. I went on to do postdocs with Laszlo Barabasi in uh, network science and um, later computational social science with Dirk Helbing. I've been uh, an associate professor for arts and technology at the University of Texas at Dallas. And now I'm the era chair for cultural data analytics here at Tallinn University, which is a large EU project um, funded with 2.5 million euro, um, having six postdocs, senior fellows, and uh, five to six PhD students. And um, most of them are present today. And uh, so let's just do the round. Um, and I'm just following my Zoom screen here, uh, Xenia maybe. Hello, everyone. My name is Ksenia Muchina. I am a senior postdoc fellow here at Kudan. Uh, I did my PhD in computer science, and I work with social media, Instagram and Flickr in particular. So I'm studying the temporal and the special trends there. Thank you. Yes, uh, Mila. Yeah, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Mila Oiva. I'm a cultural historian and um, I'm specialized in, in Soviet and Polish history. And uh, I call myself also digital historian. I've been studying circulation of news uh, in you know globally in the 19th century press in the Oceanic Exchanges Project. And um, I've been studying circulation of fake historical 
narratives in the online uh, sphere in the Russian Russian uh, internet. And currently, I'm running a project on studying uh, newsreels, uh, both in the Soviet Union and, and in Estonia. Thanks. Thank you very much. Mar. Hello, uh, I am a, a PhD student, uh, but I am also an uh, artist, in, but I'm doing practice. And I'm here, I'm, I'm doing some research that is just artistic um, driven research, um, practice based PhD, I'm doing in, in Baltic Film and Media School. And then also I'm collaborating with another more projects of uh, maybe more cultural letter analytics, analyzing museums, um, how the acquisitions they, they have been doing over everyone, uh, like since the beginning, but only we're taking contemporary museums. And then also looking some NFTs and looking some uh, tool of multidimensional space uh, projection and reduction um, with some colleagues. And I think that's it. Mike. Uh, yes, my name is Mikhail Tam. I'm a physicist. Uh, I'm originally from Russia and worked in Moscow State University for many years and was associate professor there. Uh, but last year I moved to Estonia. Uh, uh, and I was uh, actually my background was mostly in general statistical physics, complex networks and soft condensed matter, but I was always very interested in sort of working with human generated data and done this before. So I was very happy to join this group and sort of change my uh, life trajectory a little bit. And I'm doing here, well, trying to import ideas and uh, methods uh, and the culture of constructing simple uh, baseline models into into the stuff what which people do here like in terms of importing uh, some statistical physical models to uh, to understand uh, type token distributions or importing some ideas from uh, city science to understand the geography of use reels etc etc nice thank you very much mark Hello, I'm doing a PhD here under Kudan. Uh, my background is actually semiotics, and uh, now I'm uh, sort of mixing it with cultural analytics or digital humanities and computational social sciences to uh, to understand, for example, questions like cultural others or 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 about meaning space. So currently, I'm working on uh, actually um, uh, classification algorithms and stances towards immigration. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Andres. Yes, hello. Uh, my name is Andres Kreus. I'm a, a postdoc at the Gudon Lab. Um, I am a computational linguist by training. Um, but um, in addition to continuing my linguistics research, which, which mostly involves um, studies about language change using both um, corpora and, and experiments, in addition to that, I've been um, also engaged in a number of, of interdisciplinary projects now um, involving uh, da large data sets of art and television and film festivals. Um, so yeah, a, a few different things. Nice. Tillman. Yeah, hello, my name is Tillman. Um, I'm an artist by training and uh, now as a junior fellow and uh, at Kudan, I'm working on algorithmic curation of uh, collections using mainly um, vector embeddings and uh, networks. Thank you. Antonina? Hi, I'm a PhD student as well, and uh, I'm working on digital mediated art education. And also, uh, I'm a part of a study which we are doing together in the group with Mar, Max, Xenia, and Mikhail. Uh, it's about uh, the acquisition strategy of contemporary art museums. Yuna. Yes, hi, I'm a postdoc at Kudan. My PhD is on communication, but I mostly work with cultural and creative industries research, uh, primarily the film industry. I do different projects that are mostly industry facing. So I work with large industry born data sets, 
on uh, theatrical film distribution, also festivals, as Andres mentioned. Um, and I, uh, some of my work also uses networks to look specifically at the gender inequality aspect when it comes to creating films or creating other cultural content. Thank you. And Hannah. Hi, I'm Hannah. I'm also a PhD student at Kudan. I do media studies and my project focuses on how legacy media organizations use data for innovative products and services. Thank you very much. So that was it. Um, you can see there's a broad palette going on uh, of things we're doing and um, one could spend equally amount of time to sort of like uh, sort of iterate what the projects are there's just as many going on um which we're not going to do because otherwise we do this every monday <laughs> and so um yeah so the stage is yours andreas um, um we're very curious about um all your work okay Thank you very much. Um, I will try to share my screen now. Um, so, hope you are able to see it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think you have to full screen first and then um, and then uh, share the screen. Oh no, that works. Okay, good. It works. Yes, now it looks okay. good. Um, good. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. We're very excited to to talk to your to your impressive uh, lab and group. And uh, as you said earlier, I think there's a lot of common common interests uh, in in our uh, groups. Um, so what we prepared for today is really a kind of lab encounter with uh, having um, short pitches on on different kinds of projects we have been doing in, in the past years or we are still working on. So I would propose to do, um, yeah, first uh, this, yeah, the series of, um, let's say five presentations, very, very short and, and, and quick, and then have a more general uh, discussion afterwards when once you have seen what, what kind of uh, work we do um, at the lab, if that is okay with you. Yeah, excellent, that's great. Yes, let's do that. Okay, then I, I will uh, get, uh, start uh, with a, a very brief introduction of um, the, the center, the C2DH, which um, yeah, is um, now five years old. Um, we have had our five years anniversary in, in May. And uh, so basically uh, what we aim uh, at doing here um, is uh, a kind of triple mission that we have first to serve as a platform for, for discussion also on the national level in Luxembourg on issues of contemporary uh, uh, history. Um, so we have a strong focus on public history. Uh, we have lots of projects trying to translate uh, the research we do for uh, yeah, non-experts, non uh, both in, in Luxembourg, but also uh, outside Luxembourg. Second, we aim for uh, yeah, be becoming a kind of international hub for uh, a critical reflection on what the digital does to, to our, our discipline, which is basically history, contemporary history. And here we focus strongly on uh, the concept of, of digital hermeneutics. I will come back to this um, later. And thirdly, uh, we also try to promote digital literacy within the University of, of Luxembourg by offering uh, yeah, different kinds of trainings and uh, doing different kinds of, of teaching uh, at, at different levels uh, from bachelor to, to doctoral training. Um, we have like uh, four different research axes in the, in the center, two that are more thematic, one on, on contemporary Luxembourgish history, the second is on European uh, history, and then one could say kind of two transversal uh, research axes called public history and outreach and uh, digital history and uh, hermeneutics. So the idea is that most, yeah, in, in every project that we do, be it in on Luxembourgish history, European history, that we try to add that kind of public history dimension to it 
and to have that digital approach uh, being part of uh, the way we do the research and uh, we produce our output, of course, embedded in a, in a broader uh, landscape and uh, very strongly supported by uh, a digital research infrastructure uh, here at uh, the center. So the, the center is one of three interdisciplinary centers of the university. So it's a bit different from maybe other labs or, or research departments. So we have like the status of a faculty. There are three interdisciplinary centers at the university and three faculties. And they are at the same uh, kind of yeah, organizational level, if you want. And that, of course, gives us some kind of yeah, freedom and flexibility uh, when it comes to um, the organization of our, of our, of our work. Mm -hmm. So we have been growing quite fastly over the past, uh, past five years. Uh, end of this year, we will be some 120, 25 people. Uh, and uh, most of them, of course, based on um, external funding or contracts uh, that are limited um, related to projects. But we have some some 40 people as, as staff with uh, permanent contracts, so which is quite, quite big. Um, as I said earlier, our yeah, mission and philosophy is to explore how the digital interferes in the practice of, of, of doing, um, doing history. Uh, we herefore uh, use two concepts um, that somehow reflect how we do this. First, thinkering, uh, that is a, a coin a term, uh, a term coined, sorry, by uh, Erki Utamo, uh, a media archaeologist, uh, bringing together this idea of tinkering, so th this hands on approach playing around with technology, and on the other side, the, the critical thinking, the reflection on how this, uh, how these tools, how these infrastructures, how the data changes the way we think history, we do history, and we narrate uh, history. And for this, we yeah, use the concept of trading zone from uh, yeah, sociology of knowledge, which really reflects on yeah, how do we produce new kind of historical knowledge in that interdisciplinary uh, setting? And uh, the, yeah, the niche of C2DH in, in, in a certain way is really this uh, idea of, of digital hermeneutics. Uh, so not just to, to develop new tools, to uh, build new databases, or, uh, but to critically reflect on how uh, all of this, uh, these digital interferences uh, really change the way we practice um, history in the digital age. So as a national platform, we, yeah, we have invented some kind of specific formats to reach out, like the Forum Z, Forum Zeitgeschichte, where we go out of the ivory tower of the university and organize public debates with, with partners. Of course, we organize uh, conferences, we uh, develop uh, virtual exhibitions that are really um, targeting uh, more the Luxembourgish audience, for example, on the, the history of the postal services or the First World War in Luxembourg. This is also part of a kind of yeah, business model that we have developed at the beginning of the center to have projects uh, realized in collaboration with, for example, ministries, or uh, also companies uh, in order to yeah, study their past, but also to tell that history in a more uh, playful and more digital manner. Yeah, internationally, uh, uh, we of course want to invite uh, people to come to Luxembourg to talk about the, the kind of new approaches that are around. We do this in, in research seminars uh, and we have a hands-on history uh, lecture uh, series uh, where it's very much on the reflection of how, how we do uh, history. We have training uh, units uh, for our doctoral students. Um, and here the focus lies very heavily on this concept of, of digital uh, hermeneutics. 
we have, of course, international research projects. And because you were talking uh, and I was listening to, to the many interesting projects you presented, and there was a lot of relation to, to film, to radio, to television. So we have one big international research project called Pop Cult 60. It's about transnational popular culture in the long 60s with uh, Saarbrücken uh, University. Uh, actually, we have 15 projects, uh, PhD and postdocs, in working on that topic, uh, also on yeah, amateur film, on, uh, on radio. And maybe this is something we can also discuss uh, at another occasion, because I was really I'm interested in how you, uh, how you study this with a, with a more digital uh, or uh, machine learning approach, maybe. Yeah, we have other international projects with Switzerland, uh, uh, the Impressa project, um, a doctoral, a a doctoral uh, college with uh, Paris and, and Saarbrücken. So yeah, we are in Luxembourg, a tri-national, uh, sorry, tri-lingual university, uh, having German, French, and English as official uh, teaching languages. And that's, of course, also uh, a great opportunity for us to build bridges to the French or to the German uh, academic uh, system or Belgian that is surrounding us here in Luxembourg. The third mission is, of course, uh, also teaching. And so one topic that is very close to our heart is, is what digital source criticism. So how do we train the next generation of historians in applying this yeah, method of source criticism to the digital? And therefore, we uh, we developed a, an online tutorial called Ranka 2, which is uh, yeah, still in development. And we try to build lessons uh, for self-training in collaboration also with, uh, with partners having a specific expertise in one genre of, uh, of source, for example. Uh, what is really important to us is uh, yeah, multimodal literacy and uh, training both uh, our, our students but maybe even more importantly, uh, training ourselves. Uh, so we have uh, organized series of uh, skills trainings, uh, uh, sometimes demand driven, sometimes uh, uh, yeah, on purpose. And what uh, we have developed now internally is a training program uh, for the C2DH called uh, the, the training, uh, trading zone activity. And here we offer every every semester uh, uh, a number of of courses uh, or trainings, uh, really demand driven. So we ask uh, the PhD students, postdocs, professors, okay, what are you working on? Where do you think that you need you need training in order to do your research? Uh, and uh, this has uh, uh, so far um, been been um, developing very very. Uh, strongly within the C2DH. This semester, we have like 40 trainings or 45 trainings uh, that we offer uh, to our colleague, to our staff. And um, yeah, it's, it's really an important element of this idea of trading zone where, uh, yeah, we want people to, um, to get to know uh, each other's expertise and competences uh, better. Yeah, we just started a new doctoral training uh, unit funded by the National Research Foundation on uh, uh, deep data science of digital history. Here the idea is really, and I hear that you are working really in, in this very same direction of building bridge between um, yeah, data science uh, and uh, the humanities. In our case, it's, it's really then, then more history. And we structured this new training uh, unit on on three like main pillars, deep data and knowledge, deep data analytics and learning and deep visualization and interpretation. And uh, we are now at this moment recruiting PhD students for that doctoral training unit. We have uh, 18 uh, PhD positions being funded by, by the FNR. And um, yeah, we are still looking for, uh, for candidates. So if you have good people around that still uh, seek uh, to uh, do a PhD in that field, please uh, let us know. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I stop with uh, this last uh, slide. And uh, uh, it's, uh, as I said, we, uh, we just had our five year anniversary in May. For this, we produced uh, a brochure 
uh, uh, and if you're interested in in yeah browsing through our many projects and and things we have been doing in the last years please uh, have a look at the the brochure it's uh, uh, online and there you yeah find a kind of panorama of of different um, activities that we have been realizing okay i, I stop um, uh, here uh, and i just look if uh, uh, dominic has been able to join us it doesn't uh, look like this so i um i would propose um maybe then to switch if that is okay for you um stefan and victoria to the minute stories and then i i'll show the the colonia uh Mugesa project of dominic um later is that okay for you okay then i hand over to to stefan and uh, victoria Okay, thank you very much, Andreas. <clears throat> I hope you can all hear me. Uh, I'm Stefan Krebs. I'm an assistant professor in contemporary history at uh, C2DH. I have a background in the history of technology. Um, and let me share my screen. Oops. It works. You see the presentation mode as I do. Mm, we see the uh, a speaker's preview with the two slides. I don't know if I can change this. Whoops. I think you have to full screen first and then share. Then that okay. works. Let's try. I do think. <laughs> nope. mm -hmm. Andreas was saying something, but uh, you're muted. I think. <laughs> yeah, I had the same. I, I was just going from this uh, uh, presenter's mode by to the to the full screen mode by saying play the play the um, uh, slides. That is also a way. I mean, it doesn't work. It doesn't matter. You can see the next uh, slide then. <laughs> Helps me to focus. Um, if you, um, but you can see the slides now, huh? Yeah. Okay. That, okay. Whatever you. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I will talk about uh, a project called Minute Stories. Uh, this is a project we have been organizing since 2019 in the framework of the European Capital of Culture ESH 2022. So that was a project aiming at the broad public. Um, it was, uh, as you can see, a uh, team effort. Um, the core team uh, comprised uh, seven postdocs, uh, two PhD students and myself. And if you have never come across the term MINET before, um, don't worry. Um, this is the name of the southern region of Luxembourg, um, the mining and industrial region of southern Luxembourg, to be precise. Uh, so before banking and investment, uh, there was iron and steel in Luxembourg. So roughly between 1870 and 1970, uh, the economy of the country relied on the exploitation of iron ore uh, deposits in the south of Luxembourg. Uh, and of the production of iron and steel in the country and exporting it to the neighboring countries. Uh, Luxembourg was already in the interwar period, uh, one of the, um, I think, six largest uh, iron and steel producers worldwide, uh, which is quite uh, impressive for such a small country. Uh, and still in the 1970s, um, <clears throat> the country relied uh, very heavily on the steel industry uh, with the uh, major steel company, Arbet, uh, contributing some 20% to the national uh, GDP and employing still some 27,000 people. Um, but also since the steel crisis of the mid-1970s, uh, the iron and steel industry has been in decline and the southern region has been largely deindustrialized. Not completely, they're still to producing uh, steel mills uh, in the south, uh, one directly neighboring our campus in uh, Belleville. Um, so the 
project Minet Stories is a project about the history of the region. Uh, it should kind of tell people from the region, but also beyond uh, something about the history, especially the iron and steel history of the South. Um, but we did not focus on the, let's say, history of technology, but we uh, told more kind of everyday history of um, that region. Uh, Minute Stories is uh, well, was not only, it's almost finished, uh, not only a digital project, uh, but we also had some, let's say, uh, analog encounters with real people. Um, we organized a temporary history lab in the city center of uh, esch We have organized a large multimedia exhibition in one of the um, old industrial halls on our campus. Uh, we have, uh, but also kind of uh, produced some uh, digital outlets uh, like uh, a small game, a uh, geo-based uh, game uh, that helps people to explore the history of our campus that has been uh, a steelworks and an ironworks um, up until the 1990s. Um, Andreas already mentioned uh, the virtual exhibitions that have become something like a kind of trademark of C2DH. Um, these are uh, web-based project, uh, projects on uh, different uh, topics. Um, I will briefly uh, introduce four of them in the next slide. Um, I call it a kind of linear narratives because we still kind of offer something like curatorial texts on different historical topics. Uh, but uh, as people do on the internet, they can kind of explore these exhibitions in non-linear ways. Uh, all these exhibitions are based on collections of digitized sources. Uh, so what we do in these projects, we also kind of digitize a lot of analog sources from different libraries and archives in, in the region, uh, in the country, and uh, integrate them into the storytelling of these virtual exhibitions. Um, and um, another way kind of to describe these virtual exhibitions are that uh, they are kind of transmedia storytelling projects. Andreas already mentioned very briefly, uh, I think two of the exhibitions. So uh, Minute Stories has been the fifth exhibition. The very first uh, was launched in 2018 uh, about the history of the First World War in Luxembourg. Then we had a virtual exhibition on um, the history of the post system in Luxembourg. We had one on the history of a major bank, the BGL. Uh, and finally, the fourth was the exhibition about the German uh, speaking parts of uh, East Belgium. Then I stop sharing here and I. Oh, a bit slow. I have to. switch to the browser, I hope that works better. Mm -hmm. um, so what you see here is the landing page of Minet Stories, um, the exhibition uh, that we launched uh, late May this year. Um, as all the exhibitions, it's trilingual, it's in um, English, French and German. Um, after very short introduction about what you can expect when you visit this exhibition, uh, you arrive at this um, <clears throat> mosaic of 21 stories. Um, and what we did in this uh, exhibition is that we try to kind of build on the previous experience of the other exhibitions that I just mentioned. Um, and one of the main ideas was that uh, we wanted to kind of go beyond the largely text-based narratives of the previous exhibitions and to do more kind of multimedia content also knowing that people spend uh, quite little time on, uh, on websites. Um, so the idea is to have kind of two layers of storytelling, uh, kind of a very brief layer for the surfers and then a kind of deep dive, a deep dive uh, level for people that are really interested in kind of engaging with one of the stories. Um, and very slow. Nothing happens. Let's go back. Um, when you click on one of these stories, you first go to the kind of first level of kind of the surface level, 
where you can uh, then look at the, for example, multimedia content. In this case, it's a, it's a video that I will not play for you. Or you can, uh, by clicking on learn more, kind of go to the uh, more text-based um, story uh, where you can also find all the digital sources that are uh, embedded in this story. Uh, you can kind of investigate these uh, digitized sources if you like. You get kind of metadata, short descriptions, etc. Um, and I stop again here. And I hand over to Victoria. Uh, she will kind of introduce you to some of the multimedia um, story formats that we developed for uh, Minute Stories. Because yours. Okay, so again, I guess. Um... Hmm. I don't know how to expand it, but you see it, right? So, no. Um, hi, I'm Victoria. I'm one of the members of the Remix team with uh, Stefan Krebs as our project leader. And um, as he mentioned, you see here an exhibition of different stories, the pebbles, basically. We call them pebbles on a flat um, surface. So all of these stories have all the different perspectives to the to the history of the minets of the mining, mining industrial region uh, of Luxembourg. So uh, with these stories, we wanted to tell a less known history of the region. We wanted to uh, explore the stories of people that uh, inhabited uh, this region, the stories of the families, the stories of, um, of interactions of different groups, um, from uh, from the stories of, from uh, industrial environment uh, envi from um, uh, pol environment pollution to uh, the development of photography in the region. So here I'm going to present to you just a, a few of different formats of those stories, and um, I will start with a radio play. Um, so as Stefan explained, there are two levels: basically the long read and uh, um, and the short version that is a multimedia version that you can listen to, for instance, the police report about the riots in the industrial town of Ai. So I personally have 20 things to do on the end. Herr Adjum, schreibe doch. Protokoll Nummer 877, unterzeichnete Reis Nikola, Polizeikommissar, Anwesender, Adjunkt Ludewig, schreiben Sie, da selbst Protokollant und Zeuge. Bei den Vorkommnissen in der Nacht vom 26. auf den 27. November 1918 ist eine Horde, nein, halt, schreiben Sie, zog eine Menschenmenge von überschlägig etwa 5000 Personen durch die Stadt Esch und hat 62 Geschäfte zerstört. So, just a little excerpt. Um, of course, this has been done by the voice actors as an actual radio play based on historical documents about this riot in Ash. Um, so an interesting um, thing about uh, about it, of course, that it's again a lesser known story because Luxembourg is not normally known uh, for uh, being a very uh, opposite, uh, a very politically active, uh, uh, politically active community. So um, the radio play exposes the story of uh, uh, about these riots from a perspective of policemen writing the police report. Um, so, uh, of course, then we can go further on to the story of um, Italian communists, again, that are quite under, um, let, let's say, was are not enough uh, researched here in the region. And this is a graphic novel. So with this means, one could one could gain a perspective of uh, uh, of a semi fictional Itam Italian communist uh, miner in the south of Luxembourg. So here you can see uh, the graphic novel artist exploring through different chapter the history of um, of Italian community communist community in the Minet. Further on, 
I will present to you the um, mini documentary that we've done about um, about uh, photography during the decline during the industrial decline in the region of Minet. And this is a format of interactive mini documentary. Minet before it would disappear altogether. One by one, the blast furnaces were being dismantled, taking with them significant parts of regional identity that had been carefully forged for decades. Levan Aminet became a collection of black and white photographs by 16 amateur and professional photographers. It is divided into the sections, landscape, work, and family. Um, so again, the, um, it lasts for quite a long time. So I will just stop here um, to introduce to you this format um, of mini documentary, the screen that is split in four uh, with the main video on uh, in this section, the subtitles and another one to the left and the two lower ones are assigned to introduce different historical materials like newspapers and photographs about the time. So which uh, encourages the user to um, to actually discover and become a researcher of one's own. And while through through this, for instance, while I'm looking, I can look up, I can um, uh, I can um, uh, click on the uh, document and um, which uh, which um, then kind of leads me to the archive section of the website that is right here. So in the archive section, everything is basically um, all the uh, original documents used in the stories are uh, uh, situated there. And every user could just look them up and go through them and look through the descri description and kind of become a little bit of an explorer of one's own. Um, so such different um, multi-modality and different, different, the use of different multimedia um, multimedia formats actually allows for the multi-perspectivity. So telling the stories through different perspectives of the different uh, uh, different people living in the Minet, be it Italian communists or policemen uh, that uh, had to deal with a riot in Ash or the photographers that were active during the times of decline. So, and here, uh, through these formats, we wanted to uh, get our message across and to make the stories of, let's say, ordinary people of the Minets more interesting. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, uh, Stefan and Victoria. Thank uh, you. Without further ado, I would hand over maybe now to, to Lars, if that's okay for uh, the two short mm -hmm. presentations of the AAA and the Letterbox project. So um, yeah, sure. time is time is running. We have to be short, uh, unfortunately, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks a lot, Andreas. Um, well, and uh, it's a pleasure to talk to you. Um, I really saw in, already in your introduction, there's a lot of overlaps of different things that we do. Um, today, I'm gonna show you two projects um, that are pretty diverse in terms of what they try to tackle. Uh, but you'll probably already see some of the relationships to your work uh, that will come up there. So first of all, my name is Lars Wienicke and I'm in charge of the digital research infrastructure team um, of the C2DH. And uh, let me just share my presentation with you and uh, I have to pick the right one. There's, there's really a lot of windows that I have open now. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Um, okay, right. I'm almost there. I think it should be this one. Okay, so probably you see um, my PDF file there. Let's skip to that. Okay, let's start with AAA. And so AAA is um, the name of an INR funded project. So that means that it's a cooperation between the um, between Luxembourg and France. Uh, so we cooperate there with the University of Lyon, um, a few partners also in Belgium. And what we try to do there is to bring together um, computer science, in particular deep learning, image analysis parts, and art history. And this is not an easy feast um, because the, uh, the ideas, the concepts, the principles um, of both disciplines are really, really far apart. So um, one of the big challenges in the initial part of the project was to try to find out something like a common basis of understanding 
uh, so for example, what is actually deep learning um, and how could it affect uh, art history? And this is still something, I must say, so more than a year into the project, this is still something challenging there. Um, but what I would like to show you now is uh, something like a prototype that we're currently developing. Um, and again, it's something where we try to mitigate between, okay, what can we do from a computer science perspective in terms of analyzing uh, images and artworks? And uh, what is it actually that our colleagues from art history would like to convey um, in these aspects? Uh, our task is specifically in developing interfaces that enable people to explore um, different kind of artworks. And um, this initial design prototype was really guided by, uh, uh, I think, one of the one of the greatest inventions in um, in interface technology in the past years, and uh, that is TikTok and its concept of, um, of navigating between different kind of videos. Um, but what we did here was, um, it's a very simple application in that sense. So the user takes a picture, uh, which becomes a seed image uh, for different forms of analysis. And then on the mobile phone screen, they will see a couple of different kind of other images that relate to that. And so we use actively these kind of four corners in here. And the four corners can be actively attributed to different kind of types of analysis. So um, here we can select a color analysis, a shape analysis, an artist uh, analysis. And uh, so what actually happens when you click on these different kind of corners is that um, based on a certain kind of, uh, of the specified uh, dimension, you will explore the further images in there. Um, and there we have some very interesting discussions also with our colleagues from art history about okay, what is actually relevant. Um, so what means color, for example? And um, uh, as it turns out, color in itself is not really uh, something that conveys any kind of meaning uh, in the domain of art history. But what conveys a certain kind of meaning is, for example, a color distribution. So looking at, okay, how many green shades in relation to uh, blue shades and so on and so forth are in this are used in this picture. Um, and so we're moving forward step by step um, through a very iterative approach in order to find out dimensions that are meaningful to art historians at the same time as they are to uh, museum visitors. And so what you can do uh, in this uh, clickable prototype is then of course, okay, so uh, see the big picture. So see uh, images that are related uh, to a core and start picture, but also then move on to the specific images and then switch also to a kind of a recognition tasks in there, for example, that, um, that we use uh, yeah, the detection of a certain kind of objects that we can identify, sun, mountain, and so on and so forth. And from there, you dive deeper into the rabbit hole in order to explore this kind of very large collection. Um, so we work uh, concretely with several museums in France, Luxembourg, and Belgium, um, but also, of course, have access to the broad scale of uh, other kind of documents and um, pictures that are available in there. Um, but as uh, as with everything digital, um, of course we would like to uh, we would like people to explore these images, uh, find connections between also their everyday life because the seat image can be anything, doesn't need to be in a museum. Um, but that's not the not the main thing that we're after. What we're after is the interaction history of people. So which people, uh, which images do people actually select? Um, which images do they click uh, click away? And how can we use this kind of information in order to improve the automatic recognition tasks um, that the computing models do? So uh, this is something that is very helpful for us, happening on two levels there. Uh, so an explicit selection where people basically bookmark things and the interaction history, uh, which is automatically gathered and uh, built up and curated by the interaction that people do um, on the screen. So the project is very interesting in that sense as, as we try to, find, to mitigate or to communicate between those two different domains and um, try to move forward to make them both talk to each other and develop something relevant there. Um, and I'm, uh, so we're very much moving forward with these kind of designs. And I'm also very much looking forward to test them in the museum environment um, and to implement them and connect them to the back end so that instead of something very abstract, you will see actually something happening there. Um, second project I would like to show you is uh, Letterbox. Um, so Letterbox is an FNR funded project. So the national funding body of Luxembourg who's sponsoring our research there. And um, there we are interested in making shell companies visible. So um, mostly um, Luxembourg is uh, famous for, uh, for a lot of different things, um, but also something like a very interesting concept and legislation uh, that supports uh, shell companies going back to the end of the 1920s. Um, and 
what we are interested in there is uh, to understand, okay, how does Luxembourg actually function within the networks of uh, international um, tax optimization systems? And uh, what are the local infrastructures? Because of course we know that um, uh, those things don't fall out of the sky, but uh, one of the guiding theories of the project is that uh, over the course of almost a century, something like an, yeah, like an infrastructure has emerged in Luxembourg that supports the creation of shell companies and tax optimization. And we would be like to understand, okay, how does this infrastructure operate? Um, so they are at the core of the financial place in Luxembourg since the interwar period. And uh, something that is um, something like this, the core source of our uh, research in there is uh, what is called the Memorial, or initially called the Recueil Spécial des Publications Faites en Conformité de la Loi. This would, this uh, um, is so basically a public, um, a public and a publicly accessible uh, publication about what kind of companies are created at what time in Luxembourg. And sorry, I have no idea why, but my car alarm is sounding. Uh, before, so before the neighbors go crazy, let me turn it off. Um, okay, and uh, so this memorial basically contains all, ki all kinds of what we call messages that companies uh, uh, publish during their creation, uh, during their emergence, during their closure, and so on and so forth. And for the period of 1996 to 2016 alone, we have more than 2.6 million uh, of these little messages in there that need to be analyzed, because obviously they cannot be read. Um, to give you an idea on how this looks like. So this is something like a more or less born digital source, um, but it's born digital and converted into a PDF file, which makes it a little bit unaccessible. Um, but to give you an idea what we talk about, so they usually have always the same kind of format. And there is the name of the company, there's uh, the address, which is very interesting for us to, in order to map, okay, where in Luxembourg actually do these things um, settle themselves. Uh, we have a lot of different kind of uh, person names. Um, here in this case, for example, Maître Francis uh, Kessler is uh, a Luxembourgish person, so that's something that's very interesting for us, uh, that is handling um, on the behalf, that, that is handling the situation as a notaire. And here we have uh, Ma uh, Madame Sophie Enrion, uh, which is actually an employee of the, uh, of the notary, and uh, so she's stepping in for the actual owners uh, of this company. And that's a, that's a pattern that we always see, and that's a pattern that makes Luxembourg so, so interesting for this type of investment. But uh, as you see, and um, I mean, you're, you're working with uh, named entity recognition, information extraction, so this is something like a challenging part for us to extract this information in a clean and usable format. Um, to show you the diversity, so we also have the sources from 1929, uh, which were scanned on relatively high resolution and uh, processed using OCR, and uh, there we would like to do the same kind of uh, information extraction. <clears throat> to make sense of all of this, uh, it's of course necessary for us to uh, not only extract uh, the persons, so here we have G. Markel Fluckinger, um, and uh, to relate that to other kind of information. There we use um, external data sources, uh, in this case, the Paradise Papers, um, of which there's really a significant overlap uh, with a lot of the information of the persons we have in here. And um, the next step for us is then to analyze that, and I will show you a little bit of our analytical platforms in a minute. Um, one other aspect in the, as we're interested in the, um, in the infrastructure um, that is behind uh, these kind of uh, companies, um, the lawyers play a very important role in order to um, you know, to understand okay what they are doing how they how the domain of lawyers has developed um, and the the Luxembourgish board of lawyers um, has their membership lists um, of course but they are not very accessible in order to provide them to us in this regard um, but there's an, a bunch of very alternative sources that I would just like to mention there so here we have uh, two screenshots from the Marine Calendar. Uh, from 1952 and 1982, which basically contain uh, the lists of all the lawyers in Luxembourg for the respective years. So this is something like an alternative data source uh, <clears throat> that fits very nicely into what we want to achieve and uh, where we can extract uh, the information from. Um, one word about this kind of uh, data source, so it's called the Marine Calendar, which is uh, something like a very odd name for a source. Um, and it consists basically for 50%, um, it's a publication of the Catholic Church, which has been going on for more than 120 years in Luxembourg. And um, it contains for 50% some 
general statements about good, good Christian life, Catholicism, questions if you have to the Virgin Mary and so on and so forth. <laughs> but the, the more interesting part, the second part is um, a list basically of every person that was employed by the Luxembourgish state, including their position that they had in this uh, corresponding year. Um, and besides people, so here, for example, you see um, the different kind of uh, courts uh, that I mentioned here, but it's everything. And uh, you also have the information about what kind of position somebody had uh, at a given year. And uh, in this case, we also have the names of the different kind of lawyers and their state of um, employment at that stage. Okay, let me just quickly jump to a very short uh, demonstration of what we're using there to analyze these things. Uh, I got to mistake with one minute. And now I just have to find the window again. Because it turns out that uh, Zoom stopped really sorting this according to the applications. I mean, they still do that somehow, but oh, uh, yeah. Okay, let me share this. Okay. All right. Um, so here is um, Histograph, a tool that we developed some time ago in order to make uh, larger scale collections accessible. And um, I just want to. So what you can do here is uh, to have either full access to all the documents in there. Uh, you can define relationships of what kind of persons are mentioned um, in here. Uh, you can filter uh, by date, time, and so on and so forth. And um, this is one of the features that we're currently evaluating further. Um, that's called the, uh, the bucket of explorables, maybe not the best name in there, um, but something that gives us in this case, so it's 10 years um of data that we have into introduced there and so i can get something like an overview between um okay when does the term panama uh, appear in which of these years i can dive into um all of these uh, resources that mention uh, those different kind of years and uh, well, right now it's of course a demo effect that the loading takes some time as yes so there you see those different uh, documents and i can access the individual documents in there as well um, but just to showcase, so this works really nicely. So Niue is uh, an island in an island state in the Pacific that you might not have heard about, but it, it gained some popularity in the year 2000 um, in transferring different kind of enterprises from Luxembourg to um, to this wonderful island. And um, so it's something where we can actually already, um, despite the rather cursed um, NLP and uh, information extraction process, we can already see, okay, yes, uh, that indeed uh, there were some kind of peaks uh, that we can then follow up and dive into the specific kind of documents in order to see, okay, what kind of companies were involved, uh, what did they do, what did they transfer in there. Okay, so, so much about those two projects. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks a lot, <laughs> Lars. Um, then, uh... Yeah, I hand over to uh, Daniela, who is our lead designer here at C2DH, and uh, he's presenting a project we did with the STATEC, uh, so the National Office of uh, Statistics. Hello. Uh, hi, yes. <laughs> Thanks for the presentation. Uh, well, my background is also in uh, data visualization, and what I'm going to show you here is just an experiment we run with the National Office of Statistics. Uh, so do, do you see my screen? Do you see the browser? Yes, very good. Uh, so this is the name is from Luxembourg is basically the result of a four year project that we, we run with them, and this is just uh, um, a collection of uh, visualization uh, and uh, documents related to four main areas that we discuss with them. So uh, there's also a book uh, coming uh, that is uh, is around the same topics. And I think here uh, we wanted to just experiment in terms of interaction with uh, primary sources. Uh, so we collected the different documents from uh, national archives, but also uh, we dig into the, the archive of the Office of Statistics to get out some uh, historical data set and so on. Uh, the main um, interaction here is based to this uh, scrolly telling techniques, which means that uh, with um, the act of uh, scrolling with the mouse or the, the finger, you just unveil um, narrative. And uh, the narrative leads to a uh, central focus 
for for the for the visitors, which is this uh, uh, curve. So we decided to use the statistical curve to just tell a story about, uh, in this case, in migration in Luxembourg. So how migration uh, has been perceived by statistics and how uh, it has been uh, then bring to politics. This is a, a long story. I will just make it short. So here you see that there is a, um, a narrative on the left where you can have several uh, documents uh, that uh, you can uh, analyze in deeper detail. Um, at the same time, you have the possibility of focusing different uh, fragments of the core. So the idea was to tell the story of a single core uh, by using uh, documents on the side, but also uh, to have the possibility of linking other data sets at the same time. So we tell a story about a specific moment in time through this main uh, visualization, and then we have another visualization, another data set on the left. So all the data um, have been collected by Paul Zalen and Benoit Macherus, so the two main researchers in uh, the project. And um, well, you can uh, navigate across the different axes and following the story. What is so interesting is that this kind of interaction allow you to build up the visualization. So the migration curve um, is indeed part of another uh, indicator, uh, which is the, um, uh, the the global the global balance of population, which is based on the, the natural. Uh, balance of population and the, uh, the migration. So how do you see the migration effect on your population? So here, this is uh, what we decided to, to do. Indeed, we can uh, link uh, the left side and the central part of uh, the visualization, just showing different visual variables at the, at the same time. Uh, the sources are very disparate, so that uh, official sources as uh, the data set, but also let's say, less official ones. So there are fragments uh, coming from the newspaper. So this is uh, uh, in, interesting in its, uh, in its own. And then in, a, in another, I'll just show you the next, uh, uh, the, the next uh, chapter, which is uh, around family. Here, there are a lot, a lot of interesting pictures coming from um, uh, the, the city archive. So we collaborate with different um, institutions to get really an overview of, uh, in this case, how to build up the concept of family. Uh, you see here, there are uh, some, uh, some dates that are highlighted. Uh, there's uh, for, for the epidemics of cholera in this case, and for um, yeah, some fluid uh, event in Luxembourg. And then you see here, for instance, uh, like very old pictures uh, that show a bit uh, the context of uh, of how family uh, changing that was shaped through the in this case family planning uh, always uh, focusing on the same uh, curve that we have in the center in the central part there are also uh, interesting links with the um, uh, yeah, yeah, with the, the theoret theoretical aspect of how statistics uh, was uh, conceived in Luxembourg, so there's uh, the parallel story of uh, Gerard Calou. So it's the the interesting point here is really we were uh, able to mix up uh, the two levels: the uh, the visualization aspect, the data visualization, with the uh, narrative aspect. I think I, I try to be as quick as possible, but please, <laughs> if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Very good. Thanks a lot, um, Daniela. Uh, and I hand over to uh, Frédéric uh, Claver, who is um, also assistant professor at the CTDH and uh, managing editor of the uh, new journal of digital history that we have started like one and a half year ago. Okay, thanks. Uh, good afternoon. So I, I will start right away. Uh, and indeed, I am going to speak about the Journal of Digital History that we started so a year ago, as Andreas just mentioned. Uh, I'm always presiding at the beginning of such presentation, but I'm not the only one here. 
um, who prepared um, who prepared this presentation, but I'm part of a team. You can see um, you can see um, all those who participated to this presentation. Um, so um, the Journal of Digital History is international, academic. It's double blind peer review. It's open access uh, with no charge for the authors. Um, and uh, it's a joint venture with the Greuter, and it's based on the principle of multi-layered article. So uh, what are multi-layered multi article? We basically, the, the original idea um, uh, comes from Robert Danton from a text called The New Age of the Book in the New York Review in 1999, and Danton Imagine that uh, books online could have something like six layers. I'm not going to um, uh, to detail that because basically it's not necessarily um, the most important part. But the thing is that you could imagine a book that could unfold unfold in different layers, and each layer uh, having a, a different uh, function. Um, Danton is not the only one who tried in history. Uh, to um, to experiment with the web, you know, you've got the famous project, the Valley of the Shadow, uh, from the '90s that started with the CD-ROM, uh, ended today with um, uh, as um, a website, and which describes in several ways um, how two communities, so basically slaves and their white owners, lived the um, the American the U.S. Civil War. Um, and, and it is in some sort, it is multi-layered because you can access some data, you can have some stories, um, uh, and and there are some tools to um, to uh, to look at um, to look at the primary sources. Um, there are other um, other experiments. Here are some. Um, some examples, uh, but basically what uh, was missing in our case, it's um, mainly the hermeneutic layer. Um, and that's what I'm going to explain you now with the demo. So basically all articles um, of the Digital of the Journal of Dig Digital History have three layers. The first layer is the narration, the narrative layer, ba basically the results of your research. The second layer, it's the amenities layer, so it's methods, uh, digital tools, and some critical perspective on those methods and tools. And in the tools, I we include um, the code. Uh, that the computing code that you may need, that authors may need to write um, to um, to under their data or to visualize them. And the third layer is the, the data set itself. So how um, an article on the Journal of Digital History will look like, it will look like this, uh, that has been designed by Danielie, who is here. Um, basically, when you land on, when you open one of the articles, so it's fully online, there's no print version. Uh, when you um, <clears throat> when you land on, on the article, you will have the narrative first um, a visualization of the article. Um, and from the article itself on the web page of the article itself, you will be able to switch to the narrative layer here if you want to see some part of the code that was um, written to um, for this article. Um, and you can, of course, go to the amenities first visualization. And then uh, with the table of content on the side, uh, go directly uh, to the paragraphs, the, the amenities paragraph that are of interest to you. Um, from there, let's go back to the narrative layer. Um, and then you will be able, if you click on the launch binder, um, 
button, you will be able to visualize the article as uh, a code notebook, a Jupyter notebook that you may know. You may know um, Jupyter notebooks. It's basically um, a way to display codes and texts um, within cells, and each cell can be executed when it's code cells. That means that from there, you can go uh, to um, cells with code. Just a minute, so that I can find one here, for instance. Uh, and you can replay the code. Uh, for instance, in another article, two authors are using topic modeling, uh, basically to um, uh, to, uh, to create a smaller data set from a very huge data set. And you can go uh, to, um, to the code, uh, to the topic modeling code and change the um, settings of their topic modeling to see if uh, when you change the settings, um, if when you change the settings, so uh, basically when you change uh, their hypothesis, uh, the result will significantly change or not. So you can test the code, but test behind the code, the hypothesis um, uh, that their code is based on. Uh, we are using um, Zotero to handle the, um, the um, bibliographic references. Uh, we've got, because usually there are lots of bibliographic references, some filtering system that you can uh, find also on the um, articles and issues page. So you can filter the article by keywords, but also by uh, libraries if you're more interested in the code or hermeneutics part. Each article will have a fingerprint. So outside the circle, it's uh, the cells with text. Inside the cells, with, um, it's not the cells with text outside the, the circles, but the cells in the um, in the narrative layer within the article, it's the cells within the amenetics layer. So you can have quite fastly when you look at the fingerprints, an idea on how um, authors are dealing with uh, the two layers, amenetics and narrative, the third layer data set, the, the data layer, the data set itself, so it's not displayed directly. For instance, in this case, you have an article where they first start with the narration, then lots of amenetics, then they really go back and forth between the two layers, um, then um, he goes back to the narration. Some other articles are um, a bit more simple, so narration, hermeneutics, and then narration again. So that's a way to look at uh, to look at um, how articles are ending uh, with the authors are ending um, the, the different layers. Um, okay, um, I think I'm going to stop there and to wait for your questions because we are maybe running a bit out of time if we want to debate after that. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. I think we made it through the um, through all the presentations, right? So let's give an applause to all the contributors. Thank you very much. This was a great overview. Um, Just to add, uh, if you allow, um, sure, uh, Max, um, because um, um, Dominic uh, Santana can't be with us, uh, as I told you earlier. I just shared on the chat uh, uh -huh. um, two links one to the website uh, of her interactive uh, documentary colonia.lu mm -hmm. and one to uh, a short video on vimeo which explains basically uh, her project so if you if you have time and want to explore her project uh, you're you're uh, free to do so and it was a phd project dealing with uh, with the transnational history of steel migration from luxembourg to uh, to uh, Brazil, and because she discovered so many interesting um, footage, also video footage, we decided then to produce a, a web documentary uh, nice. uh, uh, online. So please have a look if you're interested. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry for omitting uh, that. Um, yes, thank you very much. This is great. I just opened the website. It looks very um, alluring. Um,
Yes. So obviously, um, so this is a lab encounter. There's two labs meeting um, and or two crowds of people, so many projects going on. And obviously, questions can go both ways. So um, impressions and so on. So if you have um, any comments, any questions um, from our side, please raise it, raise your hand or um, uh, put a note in the chat and the same is true in the other direction. Um, so I will sort of take care of like what the sequence is if more than one person raises their hand uh, in quick succession. Um, I'm, I have a, a very interesting, curious uh, question, which is sort of met up, one could say. So the cultural data analytics era chair here in uh, Tallinn University is um, officially located between three schools, the Baltic Film Media and Arts School, the um, School of Humanities, and uh, the School of Digital Technology. Each one of the members is sort of um, affiliated with some school, um, basically more or less um, uh, split uh, down into three thirds, um, including myself, including the project. So the project is sort of like officially part of the budget of one of the three schools. Um, and um, because the kind of innovation that you have done in your university, that these kind of interdisciplinary clusters uh, are sort of like separate uh, things that directly hang on, you know, in the US, we would say the provost office. Um, has not been implemented. And so obviously we have certain um, contingencies regarding the, you, you can imagine like if the budget of a large project that serves three schools is in one uh, school, for example, there is like obviously uh, some temporary, you spend a lot of money in one school, which actually benefits two other schools and so that kind of thing. But I can imagine if you do this the other way around, like if you're sort of like this freestanding thing, um, and then you still have interactions with the schools, you may have other um, uh, problems or, or issues or challenges to overcome, but also benefits. So maybe you can speak a little bit to that because um, if you're talking about 40 um, permanent people and 120 in total, you got quite a, a enterprise going on. So you probably can talk about uh, how that rolled out in the last couple of years. Andreas. Yes, I can. Oh, you have to stop me here because I could talk <laughs> for a long time about this, this uh, adventure, of course, which uh, when we started, we, we had no plan how it would really develop. I mean, uh, it, it has been a, a real experiment on our side as well, uh, both to, to think about how we want to organize ourselves internally uh, and how we want to interact with the other existing units of the university. Uh, so the faculty, for example, of humanities and uh, social sciences, which is organizing the teaching where we are uh, involved or other interdisciplinary centers uh, in, with uh, whom we, we collaborate. But um, I mean, for, 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 for me uh, or for us when starting the C2DH, uh, maybe the biggest um, or the most important question for us to ask was how we uh, want to uh, create a kind of niche mm -hmm. uh, for the C2DH within the, the existing uh, global landscape of DH, because we, we were, in a, in a way, a latecomer. Uh, 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 so I always say that there, there are these three waves, the first one starting in the, in the 60s, as you know, with the with the first computing uh, um, used for, for doing his humanities research. And then there is this age of mass digitization and so on. And then the third, which is often called the, the critical wave or the, uh, the reflexive wave in, in digital humanities. And I think we are really completely nested, if you want, in, in, in this third, third wave. So we didn't really focus uh, on, on developing tools so much. Uh, uh, or building up data sets, but more on, yeah, a critical reflection on how it changes the way we we do our, our profession as historians. And, and as you can see from the project, we strongly focus also on how we tell those history, mm -hmm. histories uh, today with digital, uh, digital means and focus um, more strongly maybe than others on the question of 
also developing interfaces. So how to translate the kind of new fundamental research you do while using data, big data of the past, uh, using uh, tools to analyze it, to visualize it, but then how to yeah, translate that for both professional and non-professional audiences and develop interfaces that make you reflect on uh, what you do while browsing, while exploring, while discovering that that past and not just to say, wow, this is this is great uh, 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 and fancy, but really to have people think about, yeah, hermeneutic dimension of the, the knowledge production that is going on with that, these new kinds of um, yeah, visualizations. So that was part of a strategic, I would say, yeah, decision-making process at, at, at the C2DH to say, this is what, where we will focus on. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, of course, um, yeah, at other departments, at other units, uh, there is a way stronger focus also within the university, maybe on the, on the analytical part, uh, on the the machine learning part, um, on the visualization part, but we strongly try to emphasize this uh, need for uh, for for hermeneutic reflection uh, when when engaging with the data. Mm -hmm. This doesn't answer really your, your your question. What kind of challenges we face in in doing that? But I think this is important because we, or I think we have a role to play as humanities scholars in that big tent of uh, digital humanities and, and beyond that, in that uh, yeah, artificial intelligence uh, hype uh, or a machine learning hype we are, we are in because interacting with many colleagues from computer science and data science also teaches us that yeah, they don't have that hermeneutic tradition. Uh, uh, and we think it's, in, it's important to bring this into that trading zone so we can teach them also uh, a lot uh, as much as we have to to learn to use uh, those um, those digital tools and and methods so it's really that kind of encounter at let's say the same eye level which i think is important uh, for us here at uh, how we position ourselves at the in in the university mm -hmm. thank you very much uh, Mila has a question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for, for very interesting presentations. And I really see that there is a kind of like wide resonance to, to many of many of the, those things that we are doing at, at Kudan uh, as well. And I actually would have questions to and comments to each of these presentations, but I try to limit myself. Um, but I, Kind of like as one of the things that we are doing here, um, and especially within the newsreel project that we are we are doing, is that um, we are also building a web interface that will allow users to to visualize and explore Estonian newsreel data, both the metadata and also um, kind of like frames of these videos. That this is still under construction. Um, uh, but um, in relation to that, uh, part of that project, I, I would like to ask actually two questions. Uh, first of all, I see that I am really thrilled about all these uh, visual exhibitions uh, that you are building. And it's, uh, it's, of course, visible that they demand a lot of work um, and curation and, and so on. Um, but uh, have you been looking at who are the users of these, uh, uh, these exhibitions and kind of like how also can you share what is your, your hint how to, uh, how to get the people to use those interfaces? Because that's what we are also aiming at to to also to share this data with the public and and I have been I have some ideas of maybe engaging with schools also or other other means but kind of like that that kind of knowledge would be really really interesting uh, another thing is that um, uh, within um, at least Lars mentioned in, in the presentation concerning the um, the letterbox, kind of like that. You have a lot of names of persons um, 
within the data and and in in that uh, project it is possible to for people to browse those uh documents and and see the names of the individuals involved in in those companies uh also in our uh newsreel um project we are we have a name we have the names of the authors of the newsreels covering uh we, uh kind of like like 80 or 90 years of, of Estonian newsreels. And, um, and uh, for example, with the UNE, we are doing uh, this network analysis to look at the structures of these um, um, film crews producing the um, uh, newsreels. But um, I'm kind of like, um, so we have the names, but at the same time, um, I'm kind of like, uh, what, what has been really problematic for me is to kind of like how much to share the names of the individuals online um, because although these uh, the names of the authors have been shown in public uh, within the newsreels and so on when we gather those information that information together and show it in the form of uh, of network, it reveals something new about the data and it it can be also, it, it can reveal some problematic things as well. Uh, for instance, in Estonia, there is this debate concerning the Sovietization of the Estonian uh, film industry right after the Second World War, which is still, uh, you know, tangible and especially given the today's situation with the war in Ukraine, it is still kind of like really um, a topical issue. So, uh, what is your policy on on kind of like showing the names of of persons uh, in in public, and and have you been discussing these these things? Yeah, many thanks. Yeah, I think Lars, as as you are also our expert on on. On, on analytics of um, um, the use of our different outputs uh, and uh, you have been addressed this question on, on, on letterbox so I hand over to you okay thank, thank you very thank you very much um, yeah thanks a lot Emilia for the for the question questions um uh, let me start with the the last one there um yeah of course it's tricky I mean uh, also in uh, on our side I think the the introduction of the GDPR so the general data protection regulation uh, that was really something like a um, yeah kind of awakening moment uh, in a certain way about okay how to reflect upon this and uh, we had a lot of discussions initially in 2017 2018 uh, 2018 uh, where people said but I'm a historian I don't need to care about this and um, then it turns out no we do we all do and uh, of course, that's correct, um, because what you're saying there that we, when we once we aggregate data, uh, we have much more insights. And in a way, that's that's what everybody said before. That's why we do these things. But we realize now, yes, it's true. Um, so we can trace back uh, different kind of uh, uh, biographies, career perspectives, and uh, so on and so forth. And we might come up with some things which are, yeah, to say, unpleasant in this regard. If we go by the letter of the um, of the GDPR regulation, and that's uh, this again, okay, it's a European regulation, but we are bound to national laws and legislations. Um, um, the point is that uh, the personal uh, personal rights uh, cease uh, with the moment of the death of the person, um, in principle. Uh, but then again, um, of course, you can come up with some kind of information that affects also the children of these people um, who are mentioned in there. And um, so that is that is something that is tricky. And that's also something that makes uh, some of the questions about uh, data exchange, um, access to this data, which we all would like to give, um, but make it very difficult for us because there's personality rights associated with things. And um, so our policy is that uh, for data that is completely uncritical in this regard, uh, we try to publish it. And uncritical means, okay, that people uh, who have died preferably before um, the 1930s. Um, that's something where, yes, uh, where we can publish, um, usually without a problem, and everything else yeah, requires due diligence. Um, so to review, okay, what exactly is the information that we have about uh, for living persons, uh, we, yeah, we shy away uh, from publishing these kind of data sets, but as we are Center for Contemporary History, this makes it very, very complex uh, in order to deal with that. 
So um, for your specific case, I, I mean, there's there's a lot of uh, yeah, pragmatic approaches about how to structure uh, personal information and person related information, um, but um, that's something we can also exchange in, an, um, in another format there together. What what you use in order to store, store this information, how you structure that, how you deal with the homonym uh, situation, how you resolve um, uh, similar sounding names and so on. That's that's the usual challenge that we face in this. Um, but for, for the practical part, yes, we would like to be very open. We would like to give access to as many people as possible, but for some things we just can't um, because it's also not foreseeable. Okay, how can this data be aggregated? How can it be used? Mm -hmm. I, have a, I have a very concrete follow-up question because mm -hmm. you have the sort of like um, almost optimal data for that to emerge as a huge problem, which mm -hmm. is uh, you had this... Um, uh, this um, this project of letterbox, right? So um, GDPR is used for the protection of people, but then you know nobody knows on Wörthersee in Austria uh, that the rich gun guy and the rich um, uh, gun side guy have a have have a bunch of houses <laughs> side by side because you cannot even talk about that anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, and you you call this with the flowery word international tax optimization system, which many country officially, like the US and Germany, call obviously tax fraud and tax avoidance system. Okay. And so there, you know, if one would follow the letter, for obvious reasons, you protect a lot of people who do stuff that they shouldn't do in their home countries. And so um, that is sort of like the key question, like how do you deal with that? Because obviously I, I would assume um, you, you you know we want to do good history uh we want to sort of like lift sort of like interesting uh structures out of the shadows which may not be so sub, super optimal for you know the national interest for the european interest for like iconographically but make something visible which is sort of maybe inconvenient but needs to make, be made visible for it to stop and so the question is like do you run into the situation where you think about like, oh, um, should, should we even touch this database or will we lose our funding because um, to a large extent, you know, like yeah. the new example, Switzerland lives off that, right? For example, yeah. people have bank accounts there. And so as a, as a researcher into that system, um, there is probably boundaries of how far one can go, right? isn't it? Um, well, I think I think with Letterbox we we will test one of some of these boundaries um, mm -hmm. also because we, we have to know so from the structure wise there's a couple maybe three four large scale um, uh, lawyer companies uh, who do these kind of business in Luxembourg mm -hmm. uh, they have something like 150 lawyers who, who mainly deal with these kind of optimization processes and um, uh, so the problem for us is that um, yeah. Obviously, my colleague Benoit Majerus, who's doing the research on this, um, will publish about that. Um, again, as in history, um, usually you don't necessarily talk about specific people because that's not the, the interesting thing. You know, so mm -hmm. the interesting thing is understanding okay, what is the mechanisms behind these kind of things. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure that with Letterbox, we will test out um, how far the information and the aggregation is actually acceptable um, or not. So, one, as a kind of anecdote in there, so my colleague also did an interview with one of the founders of one of the larger uh, lawyer companies. And um, uh, when the company then asked him, Oh, why did you interview him? Or what are you going to do with this interview? And he said, Oh, I will publish the interview once he's dead. And they <laughs> said, No, you won't. <laughs> But uh, it's uh, it's still uh, right now it's it's very unclear about what uh, what exactly will happen in this regard. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so we we are very careful. So in the presentation, for example, I also provided always the source with the names of the persons that appear there because this is public information. You know, it's publicly accessible. It's not very easily accessible. So people obviously make efforts in order to make that a little bit less accessible than it could be. Um, but it is public information in this regard. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so it's uh, we will store this information and the extracted information on our side, and uh, we also have uh, we take for us the the right and the opportunity to uh, to share that with other researchers who would be interested in there. Um, looking at a kind of cooperation agreement to access this data, we won't publish it. We will try to publish as much as we can uh, in an open access fashion, uh, but again, yeah, we we're a little bit limited, and also the university doesn't really have an appetite to go to court. Uh, mm -hmm. That's something we noticed there, but uh, yeah, makes it tricky. 
Thank you very much. Uh, Michael Tam. Well, I think actually there was a second Mila's question. Yes. Yeah, there, there, were, there was a second part, or actually the first question that Mila had uh, about um, access to the um, exhibitions. I, I think the, the one uh, thing I would like to say is that uh, to define beforehand what do you want to achieve. Um, that, is, that is the integral part uh, from my point of view. Um, there's, because there's the most dumb thing uh, that is possible in order to, uh, to look at things is to, yeah, to, to just count excess numbers. That's something that is super easy because you have Google Analytics and so on and so forth. And um, yeah, then you see 3,000 people access that. Uh, but the big question is, okay, is it actually good? What, what does it mean? And I, I mean, in a country uh, um, context like uh, Estonia and a country like Luxembourg, okay, so 3,000 people per year, is it like amazing or is it <laughs> so so or something? So it's, it's really, it's difficult to evaluate because uh, yeah, you cannot compare that to, to larger countries uh, or big websites and so on and so forth. But God damn it, what is the problem with this car? Sorry. Um, uh, so that, uh, that, is, that is a challenging part. But uh, one thing we just had, uh, like last week, um, two weeks ago, we had a discussion about, okay, what should we develop as indicators um, for our exhibitions, for example? And one thing is uh, to look at things more in a kind of qualitative way. So to think about, okay, what are, um, what are the reactions of, that people have towards our exhibitions? So uh, there we were experimenting with uh, backlinking analysis. Um, so using one of these services where you can try, uh, where you can basically see through the backlinks that are set on other websites uh, towards your own website. And um, that turned out, um, I mean, Stefan might have an opinion on that, but uh, uh, because we discussed about that, um, but I think that that's something productive in the sense, because then you can actually see what people do with it. So is somebody talking about that? Is it something where people report back saying, oh, I use this a great website in my course or something like that. So it's not something where you create something like a super nice statistic, but you can have something like a use case uh, also to understand, okay, here, we can, we can show that there is impact. And okay, last thing about that is really, um, because the problem with that stuff, when we built up these kind of data sets, when we built up these exhibitions, it's a kind of long-term investment. So that, that's what we see with a lot of our stuff um, that it takes a long time and actually to pick up. So it's something, sometimes it's five years, 10 years or something like that until it's, uh, until it has been integrated in the search indexes, but then it also has been used and reused and so on and so forth. So when building up these kind of things, um, it will take time to really show an impact. And so the best thing you can do in the first years is really to go to a kind of qualitative level where you say, look here, there was a school class which used these kind of resources in order to do um, that and that kind of presentation and so on and so forth. So we don't know if that's a big thing, but we understand, okay, there are people really who really use that independent from us. Thank you very much. This was also my second question I would have had. Um, Michael Tang. Yep. Uh, well, basically, uh, first of all, I wanted to, 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 to say thank you. It was very interesting and it is really impressive how, how much effort you, you put into making these things accessible and beautiful. And, and well, I have sort of desire to, to, to dig deeper into, into, into these sort of uh, websites and, and exhibitions and probably will spend some time on them. Uh, after we finish, uh, yes, and but actually a question, a question slash comment I had was concerning the mostly questions concerning the the first part of Lars' presentation uh, with uh, uh, sort of uh, images and uh, <clears throat> uh, different aspects of similarity. Can we maybe go back to the presentation, if possible? Yeah, sure. I think just open it. Basically, my 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 main question was was. What is uh, I, I guess I haven't understood well enough. What is going on on a computational level in, in this sort of thing? So, so you say you you uh, assuming you know that you some you you uh, want to compare uh, 
colors in some particular sense what 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 is done after that basically what what, what is the computational part of this well so the the main challenge for the computational part was actually um, there's, there's a lot of different kind of um, existing libraries existing models that you can use as a for for deep learning to do image analysis because it's, um, it's one of the big drivers um, of research and, and their application mm -hmm. and uh, the big problem for us was uh, yeah sure we can we can start with something like a color similarity and then uh, say okay show me all green pictures or just look mm -hmm. at the dominant color and something like that um, but the interesting thing that happened in the in the project and I think they were successful in stimulating this kind of discussion was um, to ask the the art historians okay they, are you actually interested in that or is it is it really something that that, uh, that is interesting and relevant um, mm -hmm. and that came up no it's not um, because yeah you know just a, a shade of green okay what is it supposed to mean and once you go down that route um, you also quickly realize oh god that that is going to be complex because you will have uh, uh, questions of color temperature, the scanning, and so on and so forth. So, is it actually the green that uh, that the picture really has, and so on? Um, but uh, and so we here we we say color, but actually something where we think it's much more much more useful is a color distribution uh, from that regard. So, mm -hmm. to understand certain kind of ratios um, of images. That are going on there, and uh, what we do most uh, most of the time is um, yeah applying transfer learning uh, on existing kind of um, um, image recognition models, and then particular mm -hmm. trained um, on uh, on certain kind of aspects. But uh, uh, when I say certain kind of aspects, that's really the challenging bit right now, trying to understand okay what is it that is actually mm -hmm. interesting for art history. Yes, yeah, so, so basically this this sort of important aspects which which you uh, are supposed to train the the thing on uh, are sort of curated so so it is yeah. it is an expert knowledge of what is important or not yes but uh, but that is also that also turned out to be much more complex than we, we initially thought mm -hmm. um, I, didn't, I didn't i was not in touch a lot with uh, art history and the way art historians work in this regard but it's something like a um, Okay, so I come, uh, any art historian, I'm really sorry for saying that, but uh, it's, it's something like a very uh, lateral process in a certain way. So part of this uh, activity is about saying, um, for example, analyzing an image, analyzing the symbolism that is used in there, and the connections that people make and is not something like, um, it, it's not direct in the sense that you can say, okay, this is, uh, this is a traffic light, uh, for example. It's much more about, okay, um, you need to have a narrative element in order to introduce why is this actually related in one way or the other. And the problem that we face in there is that um, our colleagues from Art History, they, I think they picked something like 12 paintings uh, on which they work on and uh, where they build up these kind of connections. Hmm. Um, but the, the problem is there that they, they spend a lot of work in there and it's really, it's really interesting and fascinating also to see these kind of connections. But just with the size of this kind of data set, it's, it's not something that you can transfer to machine learning. Um, because it's something that, that if you would so, put that, if you would put that in there, we just get something arbitrary out of it. Yeah, um, I I, I would like to like um, sort of follow up on this as an art historian. So my PhD is <laughs> in art history, and uh, I encounter this a lot. Mm -hmm. So art historians, like in the U.S., it, it's almost a caricature. So art historians are trained to write about art. Mm -hmm. And so there's a particular corpus, there's a particular way of working, there's a particular uh, style of debate, there's a particular debate at a particular moment going on. And what I find really curious is that the authority of authorship, like the curiosity of the person who builds a research process, is mm -hmm. put into question by saying art historians are not interested in that. Mm -hmm. I'm an art historian. If I work with to other researchers, no matter if they're art historians or not. And I come up with an interface like that. I can ask the question, what is the affordance of the interface? What's the affordance of the underlying research process? Mm -hmm. It may not be what 12 people expect starting from 12 paintings, but it may be something that they have never done. It may be novel. It may be the basis of a PhD. Mm -hmm. And so that is one of the key questions in how far we are sort of shooting ourselves in the foot by being if whenever we do something with computation whenever we do something quantitative 
by being the tool providers to people who just are saying, oh, no, I'm critical of that. It doesn't do what I want to do. Because at the very end, one can ask the question, how can I support whatever that person wants to do, art historian, literature historian, whatever? Computationally, maybe, maybe not. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, I can, whatever I do can be its own thing. And if I work with art historical data and find out, you know, that this particular thing doesn't give me anything, that's also a good result. Mm -hmm. But maybe it gives me something else, which I'm not even allowed to ask because it's considered, it's not considered part of the discipline. Mm -hmm. And I think that is an interesting thing. It's like, you know, you're already positioned not within one of these silos of the university, but now you're putting yourself into the silo and asking yourself, oh, is what I'm doing really valid? Do art historians like this? Mm -hmm. That is, I think it's a dangerous situation, so to speak. I'm also to, 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 to come back to one of your previous questions when you talked about, okay, the cooperation within the university and so on. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, on one hand, it's it's easy because uh, suddenly everybody uses these kind of tools, you know. Mm -hmm. So we, we break down silos all along the way because everybody yeah. is using natural language processing, visualization techniques, and so on. So that's that's that makes it nice. And then again, it makes it very very complicated because we have a very different kind of gratification structures. So mm -hmm. um, one of the problems we also have within the project is that. Um, uh, so we understand that uh, the art historians have something like very complex systems of relationship that are not easy to turn into something like an algorithm in a useful way. Uh, but then the computer scientists also ask, OK, so I need to write three papers in six months. Uh, otherwise, I'll never be employed anywhere again. Um, how do I do that with uh, with you guys? You know, because I, I'm not going to have this kind of output because there's a lot of the uh, lot of different kind of work that needs to be done um, in there. Yes, but it, it, it makes it interesting uh, in that regard because it was also it was very fascinating to understand um, because they, they, I think there is a way in order to to for example to uh, operationalize these different kind of questions that people ask in there. We had a very good discussion, for example, also about perspective. So the role of perspective. So seeing um, mm -hmm. something like okay here landscape paintings, uh, but it's it's just so much work because there's just been so many different types of paintings and things that you could analyze uh, in this regard. Mike, your hand is still up. Yes, because I had sort of a follow up comment, mm -hmm. which is uh, basically we we are ourselves well discussing it actively and making some experiments. Uh, but in the very, you know, unfinished stage. But the thing we were thinking about uh, that you might get a way around this sort of uh, sort of subjective curation, if you want, uh, if you study the question, what are the uh, assume uh, uh, the idea is that sort of a set of exemplary images uh, which you sort of think of as a canon, for example, for, for art historians, it sort of dictates what are the important aspects. So you can try and, and work, out, work out it in a some, somehow self-consistent way. If you ask what are the aspects which are most efficient in this in distinguishing a given set of paintings they might give you the uh, sort of what is important without going to art historian and asking mm -hmm. uh, i i'm not sure that it will work but i just share the, the idea we will we, we, we had and we're discussing here with, within our group mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, but it's, um, uh, I said it's complicated, but I think, I mean, that, that's the thing that makes it fascinating. So if you, mm -hmm. I, th I think in the, it's it's difficult to have this discussion um, also because the, you basically catapult uh, art history 100 years back uh, in this mm -hmm. kind of concept about, okay, they, there's structures, there's forms that evolve and you arrive at an end of art or something like that at the perfection and so on. And uh, so the, our colleagues, they don't want to take this perspective at all. I think it could be useful. Uh, I think because it, that's that's really something that can be formalized in a certain way because there were people wanted to formalize it also. So there has been a lot of work, uh, I suppose, going on about formalization of art and culture in this regard. 
and and just implementing that could be also very very interesting in there but it's they are um, they don't want to touch that with a stick uh, in that regard Mila. Yeah, well, I, I have a uh, short comment and, and a very small comment to Frédéric. Um, yeah, I, I personally think that this uh, Journal of Digital History is super interesting. And, and I even think that uh, these kinds of things uh, are, or, or publication or, or journals are, are things that you know, I have been waiting for for the past 15 years or so, because so far, um, uh, still the publications are often kind of like very similar that they used to be in a printed form, although when we use, uh, when we are kind of like using digital um, platforms, there are so many other opportunities that we can we can do and and so many different ways that we can show our our research and data and and code and and so on um and actually um tilman and mar and myself we we submitted just a couple of weeks ago a a um uh an article uh, for for this tool uh special issue that is upcoming so we hope to be able to to test your tool tool as well or, or this uh platform as well but uh i wanted to ask because you showed that you have these fingerprints um and and i think that that's a very interesting way of kind of like also visualizing um uh, the uh, the articles but just uh could you please explain what does the length of this, um, there are these kind of like, I don't know, what is the correct term, these kind of like sticks that go uh, outwards or inwards. So what what does the length of a stick mean? And then there are these points that are or are of different sizes. What is the meaning of them? Um, the length, it's the number of characters per cell in a cell. And the points, it's uh, the bibliographic references, if I remember well. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. We're, we're, um, we started a little late, so we have probably eight minutes to go. Um, I also would like to uh, like maybe extend one question regarding the journal. Every journal has this problem. If it starts anew, how does it build uh, sort of a the sustainability and therefore then the attraction because it needs to make it into certain indices so people actually submit something so it actually counts like here in Estonia for example if a journal is not in Scopus or Web of Science uh, nationally you know it doesn't really give anybody anything the postdoc PhD student or faculty um, so how how do you think a that works out and obviously if the additional um, property that you work with Jupyter Notebooks which uh, what do you do if somebody writes their code in Julia or in C++ or something that may be a little harder to implement or if there's something else coming along and your Jupyter notebooks of the early issues will break so so how do you deal with that we, we talk about that quite a lot <laughs> and quite often uh, we chose Jupyter Notebooks because basically there is a wide community behind it. Mm -hmm. It's not okay. going to disappear because there there were other, well, there are other code notebooks. Um, mm -hmm. In in our studio, you you can have code notebooks, but it's very limited to R and Python. Mm -hmm. Jupyter Notebooks at the beginning it's um, Julia Python R and mm -hmm. then the name. Um, and it's supposed to support quite a lot of computing language languages. So mm -hmm. that's although a criteria of choice, that was also a criteria of choice, um, providing that in digital humanities and digital history, the most popular um, languages are Python, R, and Julia, like, which is coming up a bit, rising up a bit. Uh, but it's not because Jupyter Notebooks are you know, supporting a language that our system is supporting this language. Uh, we had some difficulties to adapt to R, for instance. Mm -hmm. So the, the first articles in R will come in theoretically in a few weeks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
the second issue, but so we, we, we could go beyond that. Mm -hmm. um, but we, we mainly had demands on Python and R for, for now. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, choosing Jupyter Notebooks was also a choice of sustainability because of this large community and this quite dynamic development. Mm -hmm. Um, more generally about sustainability um, and the fact that we are probably one of the only journals in the world where an update of the website can broke the compatibility of previous articles. Um, we, we are, we've got several leads. One, one of the lead would be that we have at one point sort of virtual machine. It would not be virtual machine in itself, but sort of that would be able to start an article with the previous version, within the previous ver version of the website. So within its original um, um, environment on, on the journal's website. That's one of the one of the lead. Um, I think the, the the most promising one because for for now we could update articles. We we had one update of our system that implied to update a bit some articles, but for now we've got like something like ten articles published. So uh, it's not it was not a problem to update the articles at the same time we were updating the the journal system. But in the future it's not going because we 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 aim at being there quite a long time so in the future it's not going uh, to be possible because there will be too many articles mm -hmm. um, and more generally in terms of sustainability a part of the sustainability is the is also the responsibility of the greater they've got a system to if we happen to seize of our activity they are supposed to be able to uh, archive the journal uh, it's not that simple because we are not a PDF based journal. So I don't know if they will be able to do that. And uh, as a Luxembourgish um, website, uh, we are also um, archived by the web archive of the Bibliothèque Nationale de Luxembourg, which is also something quite important, even if, of course, web archiving knows some, some pitfalls. So I hope I answered your questions. Yes, thank you very much. And um, just to be, just to add something, I think being compatible with well, um, be, um, dealing with someone coming with a demand like I want to code a C plus plus is going to be easier than dealing with someone who wants to write his or her article in Word. <laughs> okay, very good. Um, <laughs> there is some truth to that. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Um, I, we, we made quite some journey in the last two hours. Um, there's one point which I'd like to quickly raise at the end, which is um, you emphasize uh, your uh, focus on hermeneutics, which I like a lot. And uh, there is something we would like to add as a sort of like almost um, you know emphasis from our side. So we do something which is a, a little bit uh, maybe extraordinary, or maybe some may say radical, uh, which is we have a group which includes, you know, people from machine learning art, computer science, and physics. So what is the uh, motivation for that is because um, we have seen that in other fields, such as complexity science, network science, computational social science, systems biology, and, and, and so on, this sort of confluence of disciplines has worked a lot. Um, you know, there's biologists who stay biologists, there's physicists who stay physicists, but then there's biophysicists who are neither. Um, they're biophysicists. And uh, so in a similar way, we understand cultural data analytics as a kind of multidisciplinary science where products may come out, um, which may totally be mainstream digital humanities, mainstream humanities, mainstream art history, but also something that doesn't fit that bill whatsoever. But there is one thing that I think is very worthwhile emphasizing, namely that hermeneutics is not a humanities thing that stands in contrast to computer science and tool building in, uh, you know, sort of like glorious information science slash library science. Uh, which is a part of digital humanities, but uh, it is actually very, very strongly in line 
with um, natural science where the standard model is to build a model of the world, for example, a differential equation, which you then run and you have some result which you can compare to the real world. And then you may find there is some problems in your model and you have to update it in order to make it better. So in other words, you have a sort of feedback cycle between the specific and the general, uh, much like in sort of classic hermeneutics, which for me being an art historian, having sort of like wrote on, you know, Gaudama like hermeneutics <laughs> of staring at lots of artworks, making generalizations and checking them and specifically is sort of was a natural going into network science. While in digital humanities, I'm always asked, okay, what kind of, how is this tool useful for me? Can you build that tool for me and stuff like that? And I think there is something to be said. There is um, a sort of lost opportunity, so to speak, to actually bring multidisciplinary science together with traditional humanities fields. And um, this may include um, the text disciplines like history, literature, but also the image disciplines, musicology, ethnomusicology, and anthropology um, to do something that hasn't been done before. And that's the reason we're not called digital something, but we're called cultural data analytics. And um, there is um, there's an invitation to basically uh, join us in that effort. That does not mean that we don't do all the other things, but this sort of niche that is not played out is sort of something which we should do together. And I heard throughout all your presentations that there is, on the one hand, already things going on that can be branded that way. And there is other curiosities where you are trying to go down that road. And I think that is a really, really interesting worthwhile thing where our community of cultural data analysis can grow to at least have a couple of hundred people worldwide to do that kind of stuff and not having to excuse themselves for it. <laughs> yeah, th uh, thanks. I think we are very much on the same same line here. Uh, and and we, we use uh, the, the concept of trading zone for, for exactly that purpose. I mean, it's, it's, it's a two way uh, two-way encounter, as I, I mentioned earlier, and uh, I fully agree with you. We we are also participating in courses uh, given at the computer science uh, department. So uh, they, we introduced just a few years ago a course on um, humanities data in 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 machine learning and and uh, data science. So we really need to um, to do this both uh, on both sides. And that's exactly uh, the challenge we face. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, hermeneutics um, also, we, if it's a term that most of the, the engineers and, 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 and scientists have never heard of before, uh, but of course, there are methods of uh, reflecting critically on how you produce your knowledge, how you produce evidence, how you uh, yeah, measure that, or how you have criteria for saying, if this is um, yeah, some kind of close to the gr uh, to the ground um, uh, truth or not. So, but we need to learn each other's vocabulary, and that's part of the of the trading zone idea mm -hmm. and creating kind of interlanguage, and that's the, the the challenge. Thank you very much. I think we ran out of time. Uh, thank you, Andreas, Stefan, Victoria, Lars. Um, Daniele, um, Frederic, um, see every one of you in the next uh, Kudan Open Lab seminar, which um, will be next week. And that too will be a lab encounter with uh, Armand Leroy uh, uh, et al. from the Social and Cultural Analytics Lab of Imperial College in London. Thank you very much. And obviously, we would be very happy to welcome you back again next week. Thank you very much. Bye bye.